Well, great. Thank you very much for uh, following instructions. Thank you. Um, well, good evening, everyone. and Welcome to the new Library of Mistakes. My name is Tony Foster, and I'm chair of the Didasco Education Company, the charity which oversees the library. Didasco was founded by Russell Napier some 10 years ago to pursue various activities in the world of financial education. We run a course on financial history, which is now available online, in person, and as a degree module at Heriot Watt University. We oversee Future Asset, which increases awareness of fund management among, as a career option among schoolgirls in Scotland, most recently via an investment competition which saw 44 schools make Dragon's Den style investment pitches to our panel of judges. The new library, where we are this evening, which was opened officially last night by former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Alistair Darling, is a public resource open to all. We also have branches in Lausanne and Pune in India. We hope to open a library of mistakes in the city of London, but we can't find anybody there to host it who admits to ever having made a mistake. Tonight is the first event in our week-long festival of mistakes. Tomorrow night we have an open evening and then further events on the future of money and on the Asian financial crisis. And finally, a session for readers of Money Week magazine on Saturday. Tonight's event is being live streamed, and so our lawyers have reminded me to warn the people in the front row, front rows that the back of your head will be beamed worldwide. Please move if that's a concern. I'll now hand over to Sarah Whitley, former uh, head of Japanese equities at Bailey Gifford, who now heads up the Future Asset Steering Group, and she's working alongside Helen Bradley here in, the, in, in, in Future Asset. Helen sat in the front row here. And Sarah will chair this evening's discussion. So welcome, everyone, and Sarah, over to you. Thank you very much, Tony. So what we're going to see here um, are three videos of between three and five minutes each. Then after each video, we're going to have 10 minutes of panel discussion about the particular mistake that's uh, talked about in the video. And then at the end of, of that, we will have uh, 10 minutes of Q&A involving um, you from the floor. So um, I'll now ask each of the panel to introduce themselves. So first of all, there's Alice. Is this working? Can everyone hear me at the back? Okay. Um, my name is Alice Stretch. I joined Bailey Gifford in 2018, um, and I'm currently on the long-term global growth team, and I primarily look at kind of growth equities. Hi, everyone. Well, yeah. Um, my name is Clarissa Lidman. Um, I'm an investment analyst at a boutique asset manager called Aubrey Capital Management, where I'm an analyst on our European global and emerging market strategies. Hi, I'm Kenneth McMillan, and I'm one of the portfolio managers in the Diversified Assets team with the multi-asset at Aberdeen. Thanks very much. So I think now we can hear some lessons in fund management from Dame Anne Richards. So Anne Richards has a very interesting career before she became a fund manager. So unlike some of us who have you know, the world's most boring CV from Bailey Gifford, joining Bailey Gifford and retiring from Bailey Gifford. But uh, Anne actually held a research fellowship at CERN, uh, the nuclear research establishment that has the Large Hadron Collider, and worked alongside Tim Berners-Lee, who, as you all know, is the inventor of the World Wide Web. Um, and here she's going to talk about a particular uh, mistake in fund management, which actually isn't a sort of individual stock mistake, but something perhaps a bit more fundamental. In 2002, just as the dot-com boom was coming to an end, I was approached to lead the large blue-chip fund management firm where I ran a highly successful team to go to a much smaller, struggling boutique called Edinburgh Fund Managers, and the job was to be their chief investment officer with a mandate from the board to turn the company around. Now, it was a listed company, a public company, and I'd get a board seat, which was an attraction for me. But in many respects, it was a strange time to make such a big decision. 
I felt I was ready for the challenge and I wanted to work somewhere where I had more control and more influence than you can ever really get in a large company. Now the first thing that happened that was odd was that after my appointment was announced, the biggest shareholder who owned almost 30% of the firm phoned me up to try to persuade me not to join. Now that's not something that normally happens. But I was committed and so I carried on. I joined Edinburgh Fund Managers in early September and some six weeks later went out on a regular visit to our shareholders with my chairman. Now to my surprise in the very first meeting the fund manager we were seeing leaned across the desk and handed the chairman and me a letter. That letter was on behalf of more than 50% of the shareholders and it was asking for an extraordinary general meeting to remove the chief executive, my boss, and half of the board. Now, that's a very unusual set of events. Roll forward, within a week, all of the non-executive directors had resigned, and the chief operating officer, Ross Prey, and myself had to ask our CEO to resign, our boss, remember, because we knew that the results of the EGM that the shareholders had asked for would be a foregone conclusion. So when I phoned the largest shareholder, the one who tried to persuade me not to join in the first place, to tell him what had happened, he was taken aback and he said, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Now, we were in the midst of a horrendous bear market in equities. And Ross and I had responsibility for some 250 people. And yet we didn't really have experience of leading a company, much less a listed one. But we soldiered on, we found ourselves a new chairman, and we eventually sold the business to Aberdeen Asset Management. Many of the clients of EFM are still clients of Aberdeen today, which is testament to the fact that if your clients trust you and you do a good job, they will stick with you. I stayed on as CIO at Aberdeen until 2016 when I left first to become Chief Executive of MG and then in 2018 to do the same role at Fidelity International, which is the one I'm doing today. The most important lesson I learned is that you exercise immense power as a fund manager when you own shares. And you have to exercise that power with great wisdom. Many fund managers have never managed a team, never mind a business, and yet their actions have a meaningful effect on the jobs and lives of thousands of others. So for this reason, because on this occasion I was on the receiving end of the actions of other fund managers, I've always tried to be really thoughtful and exercising our own stewardship responsibilities. Stewardship is immensely important and it comes with great responsibility. We're also entrusted by the people whose money we look after to invest it with the greatest possible care. Because ultimately, we exercise our stewardship on their behalf. I've been in the industry now for some 30 years. It has been an immense privilege to be trusted by our customers to look after their assets. And it's also been a privilege over the years to meet so many different companies and talk to them about their businesses and their strategy. The many different roles within investment too. So many different asset classes, quantitative as well as fundamental approaches, and the many roles that surround fund managers and analysts, from relationship management, to technology, to marketing, to risks, to human resources. My advice is to be curious, to be persistent. You don't always get the answer the first time of asking. To be resilient. Lots of things don't work out, certainly not at the first time of trying. And always, always, always act with integrity. Right, so with those words from what was obviously a fairly traumatic experience, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps the panel, perhaps Ken, you've 
perhaps spoken to some of your colleagues who came from EFM about some of those difficult times? Yeah, the first thing, 22 years later, it's remarkably hard to find anyone that still worked for the same company. I think there's one, unfortunately, who works on my team. <laughs> so I had a good chat with him. And I think what was a fractious situation? So you had the CEO leaving, who was in a tricky position, fund flows out, Nan coming in, and that's clearly the point at which it could be considered a mistake because who gets told by the biggest shareholder, don't do that, and you do it, you don't know which way that's going to go. For her, it worked out well. But I think when I spoke to Alan and what he said is, she and Rod were able to remove the kind of strong personalities from what was a really tricky situation. And that was critical at a point where you're not just looking after shareholders, but what you're looking after is a staff of people. And I, I think that's carried throughout her career. So you see her throughout, I've met her a few times and she's very personable, very open, very chatty. She'll sit and chat away to you. And having that ability to talk in a friendly and open way, connect with staff at what was a really tricky time. I think that's really important. And I think that's the thing that's carried her through her career to some extent. You saw in that video, she's very personable, very open and very chatty. And that's just so important in today's world, especially when you're broadcasted all over, that you've got that kind of outward looking kind of friendly personality. I think that's so critical. Yes, and particularly when um, managing investment managers has often been um, likened to herding cats. Yeah, they're not short of opinions. <laughs> so, I mean, some of the other uh, points that are raised in that are about um, stewardship. Do you, would you like to? Yeah. Um, so, stewardship is essentially um, ensuring that you allocate capital in a responsible way. Um, and one of the themes of what is a responsible capital allocation is something called ESG or sustainable investing. So ESG stands for environmental, <coughs> social and governance. Um, to take context, maybe on the private client side, um, what we've seen is that there's been a generational shift um, in the demand of ESG suitable investing. Um, so for example, We've seen family trusts who are now, you know, in that transition mode of handing it over to younger, um, younger trustees who are usually predominantly the ones who ask the question of, is this a, could we look at ESG suitable um, investing? And I think that in general, those are those who are happy um, about those who are who are happy about investing in ESG suitable. Um, funds or companies, they're not, they don't necessarily um, go into deep detail into that. Um, what you see on the private client side is they don't go into the different processes. And I think a reason for that is a lack of transparency on what sustainable or ESG investing really is. Um, there's a lack of global standardization within that. Um, and that also goes with stewardship. Um, and while we do see some global standards such as UNPRI or SFDR try to attempt to do that, it's still very much at the nascent stages. Um, I think just in general, um, you know, clients, there are different, ver there's a variety of what is called ESG investing. I think it's very much still a learning, um, like everybody in this industry is still learning about what it really means to be a sustainable investor, if that's kind of the route you choose to go into. Um, so um, I think it's just a work in progress. Um, and anyone who says otherwise, I'd love to have a discussion on that with them, <laughs> who seems, who, who, they know everything about it. <laughs> and do you have anything to say to the point about that stewardship and the PowerPoint that fund managers wield a lot of power and, you know, Anne found herself on the wrong side of that power being wielded by fund managers and that she'd always taken that very seriously after that experience. Yeah, um, I've been in the industry for less than seven years now, so just over six and a half years. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say that the average fund manager is a natural born CEO. Um, or a people manager. <laughs> um, so stewardship is really interesting because as Anne mentioned in the video, you suddenly have so much responsibility and your opinion can carry so much in how a company 
manages itself. And that doesn't necessarily mean you need to own 55% of the company. You can still own 10%. And if you're not happy with the way the company's managing themselves, you could sell your stake, you know, and that creates volatility for the company. It comes with a lot of different consequences. Um, I mean, to give context to Aubrey and how we look at that, um, we really focus on the engagement side of things. We try to give context on how we invest with ESG in mind. So we have a questionnaire, yes, and it looks at some disclosures, but um, engaging with the companies really gives us deeper insight to the company's operations um, and also kind of the overall general concerns that stakeholders, not just as shareholders, but the employees um, and the customers as well, um, and puts that into context. So I think one of the big things, and I will kind of touch back on the fact that it's ESG or sustainable investing is still at its nascent stage, is that there shouldn't, we don't apply a uniform um, kind of process into the companies we look at. We won't expect a smaller company to have the same level of disclosure or the same number of initiatives as a much larger company, for example. Um, and I think that's, and then kind of active investment, which is where kind of managers and analysts do the research themselves. Um, I think this is where we can really differentiate versus maybe passive investing um, or ETFs where you won't really have that level of insight or engagement with the companies. Right, thanks very much. And I wonder, obviously the shareholders who Anne was visiting, you know, one of them own 30% of EFM. So that's obviously when you go along, you speak to somebody like that, that's a very important meeting. And, you know, the issue of privileged access. Um, Alice, you're in the Bailey Gifford LTGG team and you have a lot of privileged access, some of it as a private investor. Um, do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think Anne really touched on the point there about the privilege we have as investors to understand companies and to get to know them and what being a shareholder can really mean and the impact that you can have. Um, and I'd say within my role and within Bailey Gifford, our privileged access kind of forms three parts. And that would be access to management, access to private companies, and also access to academics and um, other external insights. Um, so just firstly, access to management. I think as we're long-term investors, we can often have a relationship with a company management team that can last for years or decades. And actually taking their time and trying to understand their business and spending time with them whilst you know they could be under pressure from shareholders, from customers, from operations, everything else, all of that pressure. And then as shareholders, we're turning up saying, hey, can you explain this to me? Or can you spend some time um, telling me how you run your business? I think that's a real privilege to have... Um, you know, relationships with some of the, you know, leading CEOs in the world and also um, yeah, having that responsibility for clients. Sorry, I don't know if it's quite covered. Um, and having that responsibility for clients as well. To basically ask them about um, you know, making sure we're doing with their money what they'd like and making sure we're getting the information that we need. I think for managers particularly, um, company CEOs and things as well, uh, they've got a lot of short-term news flow around them and we've got to be those kind of responsible long-term investors that help them with their decision making. And for me, that basically means, as I'm saying, taking that responsibility and acting with integrity and trying to be as thoughtful as possible with our questions um, to try and understand companies better. Um, yeah, and then just in terms of private companies, so over the last few decades, we've basically seen um, real-time information, lots of people having more access to freely available information, and at the same time, companies have been coming public later, and these two factors together for me really show how developing relationships with private companies and with academics helps us have differentiated insights, which is ultimately what we've got to do to improve client returns. So um, in terms of privileged access, uh, I've worked on LTGG, my current team, and also on our emerging markets team, and both of them have private company kind of strategies. And 
um, where it's not commercially sensitive, it's actually really good to learn from these private companies about what's happening in the market because what we're ultimately trying to do is understand how business models are changing. And with big incumbents, that can take a long time to innovate, whereas with private companies, that's what they're trying to do all the time. Um, so, yeah, you've got to be sort of trusted by private company management and you've also got to try to understand what they're giving you in terms of information. And, um, yeah, so that's been like a really big learning for me, particularly over the last year. And then finally, just um, I think we mentioned um, Tim Berners-Lee there, like in our academic side of things, we have got to know Mike Berners-Lee, <laughs> Tim's brother, who's a decarbonisation um, researcher and so he's written reports for us we've also you know sponsored um academic relationships at different institutes across the world and academics are giving us their time um and that's also some privileged access there about being able to um get to know companies and understand what's happening in the world by people who are experts in their field and i think that comes back to what you are as an investor which is trying to learn from other people and respecting their time and um, whilst you have the responsibility of managing clients money at the same time Right, thanks very much. And I've just remembered another story about EFM, going back, delving back even further in the past than Anne's story, which is going to a lunch in the early months of 1988. And this was when I was managing Japanese investment trusts, and EFM had two Japanese investment trusts, and speaking to the manager, and they said, so the background of this is markets fell very sharply um, particularly in Japan at the end of um, the October of 1987. And uh, anyway, this manager said, oh, yes, we're 30% in cash. And I thought, oh, supposing he's right and, you know, markets again. And I thought, 30% in cash, that's very aggressive. We've got about 10% in cash. And I thought, well, somebody's right. And I came back thinking, somebody's right and somebody's wrong. And <laughs> this is career-defining moment. <laughs> anyway, six months later, EFM had no Japanese investment trust. <laughs> <laughs> they apparently had been bullied into it by the board. <laughs> but, I mean... <laughs> Sorry. That, that just popped into my mind. Right, OK. <laughs> Moving on, we're now going to hear from Angus Tulloch. Uh, and this is um, a stock example. And well done, Angus, for fessing up to this one.
with that philosophy and the philosophy that you're comfortable with as well. I'd also be very tempted with the benefit of hindsight if I spent 50 minutes every day uh, just writing down what I'd learned or, or specific observations because I think it would be very, very helpful as I develop my career to look back um, uh, what I've learned three, five, seven years back. Uh, very interesting too. Um, and the final point is just never stop learning. Great. So, um, sorry, I should have introduced who Angus was. So, Angus, as you heard, has started life as a broker, apparently after being an accountant for the National Bus Company. But when I first met him, he was a broker at Casnova, and then he became a fund manager sort of later on in life um, and had to switch from the sort of broker mindset to the longer-term fund manager mindset, which, as he mentioned in that, took him a while to, to adjust to. Um, so, Clisa, so how, how do you react? How does your team cope with things going wrong and how quickly do you sort of adjust to yeah. the reality that's different from the, the reality that you expected? Yeah. Um, I clearly don't have as long of a career as Angus, so I will not be talking about... Um, <laughs> big kind of stock mi mistakes but in general I would probably say this job is incredibly humbling um, we are long-term investors at Aubrey but there's definitely some days where you think you're an absolute genius like I should be a fund manager now I should have loads of money like people should give me loads of money and then there are some days where I'm like maybe I shouldn't have done this I question everything I do question why maybe I sh should I be an analyst um, and you know I think one of the things that my team has really done, I mean, I joined um, Aubrey with no, well, I initially didn't really find investing very interesting. My perception of it was not really, um, it was, I thought it was all about invest, investment banking. I thought it was like, you know, billions and, and that clearly is not the only perception of the industry there is. Um, it was a fundamental um, like Aubrey's style is growth, it's fundamental analysis. And one of the things I think the team's really done in terms of my development over the years is really just um, kind of learn to take a step back. Um, it's really hard to admit that you've made a mistake, but it's, and it's, it's also even harder to figure out why you've made that mistake and you can go into a massive rabbit hole trying to figure that out. Um, one of the things that we do is um, we just try to make it as unemotional as, and clinical as possible when assessing when a name's gone wrong. Um, and again, this is, if you, if, if, if you end up going into this industry, it can be a little bit harder um, to do than just saying it because if you, the feeling that you get sometimes when you get a stock into a portfolio for the first time, it's like, yes, somebody's listened to me, like my, my opinion matters, like my critical thinking has worked. Um, and sometimes it can be really hard to let go of that name if it hasn't done well or suddenly you need to sell it for whatever reason. Um, so, you know, with what, what our team does is we have a really flat structure. So all the managers are also analysts and nobody's assigned to any stock, which means that um, come the time where we reassess the names or do an updated research note, everybody does a different name in the portfolio. And that brings two things. It means that you're not really in love with any of the names too. It brings a new perspective into that name. Maybe someone will question why we hold it in the first place. Um, and three, you kind of get to know all the names in the portfolio. Um, and so one of the things that we do is we really re-examine the investment case, um, kind of four key things, macro, competition, strategy, and management. Any changes in that will really prompt a review. Um, and then it's really about kind of taking action. And as much as we are long-term investors and fundamental investors, um, most of the time, if a, if a stock has gone down a significant amount, um, you should take action. You should just either admit you're, admit you're wrong um, and sell the name or, you're, you're convinced that it's still a good name and people are misunderstanding it and you put more money in. Um, but I think kind of just leaving it is probably one of the things I'm discouraged to do. Um, 
<laughs> okay, and Angus's point about the fewer stocks, the deeper research, the focus less on macro issues, etc. Sounds like he's sort of drunk the Bailey Gifford Kool-Aid, <laughs> Alice. So perhaps you could talk a bit about, you know, how that works at Bailey Gifford. And Yeah, I think uh, Angus was a executive director or non-exec on a couple of tracks, so it's nice to hear that it kind of got through to him that it worked. Um, but eventually, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So um, yeah, I joined fund management without, again, similar to Kleiser, without much of an expectation of what it looked like or, or what I was doing really, and was attracted to Bailey Gifford as a reputable company, as he put it, um, and wanted to learn when I got there. And I think for me, um, a lot of a lot of this sort of fundamental analysis, not focusing on macro and, and kind of the lessons Al Angus was alluding to, um, also linked to how we hire. So we're kind of, I mean, I've, I did political economy at university, but in my year it's kind of languages, music, um, lots of different backgrounds all coming together to try and promote cognitive diversity there. Um, and I think that's a big part of the training culture that we can kind of potentially teach finance, but not necessarily teach people to be curious and try to go and understand the companies from the bottom up. Um, so for me, it's kind of, we go completely back to basics um, and that's sort of where the fundamental analysis comes from, trying to understand business models for what they are, trying to understand why would somebody want to buy a Tesla or an Apple iPhone or why, why would a customer of a surgical instruments company want to buy that one over another one um, and really asking ourselves the questions, um, not trying to look at it as sort of stocks, but the companies, the people running them and the culture behind it. Um, so, yeah, and, and as Angus kind of said as well, on sort of having a philosophy that you can kind of align yourself to. Um, I'm on long-term global growth at the moment and we look for high growth, high quality companies that um, use technology um, to enable kind of growth at scale. And I think that's something um, that's quite hard, particularly potentially in 2002 onwards, um, to believe that these sort of uh, views on companies would come through. And um, maybe it is a bit of Bailey Gifford Kool-Aid or a bit of the folklore, but trying to you know stay with Amazon during that time and stay with Tesla during turbulent times as well is really difficult. And I think taking that long-term picture also comes back to um, how long-term everybody at BG is. So uh, as Sarah kind of said, you start your career and end your career there. And when I turned up age 22 and I was sat next to a person who'd worked there for 25 years and I thought, what am I going to bring to the table or um, how long-term can I actually be? Um, but it's actually learning from them, learning from their mistakes, learning from cycles, learning from everything they've seen and haven't seen and the hundreds of companies they've looked at as well. Um, so yeah, and, and then just in terms of, of my work there on um, looking at fundamentals and the training and things, I try to look for different sources um, and basically try to understand company culture, learning from people around me and also speaking, like I said before, to academics and people outside the industry because um, you won't necessarily get all the answers from market participants and um, on the technology side, as Angus said about Liam Fung, I think... What I've learned is how to speak to management, how to learn, maybe if they're thinking differently to the incumbents, are they young, keen, maybe radical, um, and being prepared to disrupt themselves, um, and also are company managers prepared to be wrong as well, the same way that fund managers are. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of my learnings on the training and philosophy there. Brilliant, thanks very much. And Ken, could you talk a bit about learning the CFA exam? How is that as a learning experience and just quite how hard is it? Uh, I think the hardest part is like, I think I did exams from when I was 16 till when I was 26 without a break, which is brutal. Every single May over my birthday, I was always studying. That's the way life goes. I think, especially if you're not from a financial background, it's really useful to build fundamentals and there's specific chapters like the uh, financial balance sheet analysis type of stuff that's just really useful for digging into a company, understanding how it works and what the drivers are, and being able to understand how different companies treat different aspects within their business. So from a fundamental point of view, I think it is really useful, and I say that a few years after doing it, so you can tell me otherwise if you're doing it just now. Um, so I think that is genuinely something that's worth doing from how hard is it? 
it's hard to say, I think, on an individual basis. I came from a financial background, so that meant some of the chapters you'd go, tick, that's fine. There are parts that are just a bit soul-destroying is the easiest way to describe it, where you've just got to plod your way through it. And I think for me, it's the effort of finishing work at 5.30, 6pm and having to sit down for another few hours and read. Um, but it is, it is worth doing. It's just a bit of a slog. Right. And I was interested in Angus's point about the investment diary, because I think is... I'm sure not very many people do, but it's very worthwhile if you write down what you thought about something at the time, not what you thought about when you <laughs> revised your opinion after events have happened. But you write down what you thought about it at the time and then what actually happens. I'm sure that is a lesson that everyone could learn and could do better. Right, the next, the next one is uh, Tony, who's here, and therefore the bravest person of all. Um, who started his investment career um, at Bailey Gifford um, and then uh, went to have a long career in Asian and UK equities, um, Scottish Widows and Aberdeen. And he's told me that his main claim to fame is that he once was an international croquet player. So, the factoid of the night. And uh, Tony's film is going to talk to us about Northern Rock. Having recently retired after a 30-year career in fund management, I can look back on my fair share of mistakes and periods of market turmoil. The Asian boom in the 1990s, the technology crash of 2000, and the Eurozone crisis of 2012 are all etched deeply in my memory. But the global financial crisis of 2007-9 was the granddaddy of them all. One incident from the financial crisis very nearly cost me my job. Northern Rock, a fast-growing bank which lent some borrowers up to 125% of the value of their intended home purchase, needed support from the Bank of England in the summer of 2007, when short-term money markets seized up at the start of the financial crisis. When this news leaked out, the next day saw Britain's first bank run in 150 years as Northern Rock customers rushed to take out their savings. The ensuing collapse of the Northern Rock share price was a big problem for me and my colleagues as our funds owned nearly 5% of this FTSE 100 index constituent. Initially, we hoped that HSBC might try to acquire Northern Rock to grow their UK market share. When it became clear that this wasn't going to happen, we decided we had to sell in the market. As a team, we didn't want to panic and thought that 290p was a fair price to sell, 15p below the market price at the time, although it was 75% down on its high of over £12, reached six months earlier. That morning we managed to sell half our stake at the 290p price limit, but then had to stand back and watch as the share price collapsed further. I wanted to contact the head of the team, Dave, to discuss changing the price limit, but he was unavailable in London. As the market closed, a broker bid the remainder of our stake, which was 2.5% of the company, remember, on behalf of the hedge fund at 245p, 15% below the price limit. What would you do? Take the bid of 245p or stick to our agreed policy not to sell below 290p. After discussing the potential trade with our head of dealers, I felt we simply had to take this opportunity to sell out. We might not get another chance. That night, Dave called me at home, very angry. You panicked and cost us performance, he said. The next morning, I was at my desk by 7 a.m., fully aware that if the share price banked above 290p, or even 245p, Dave would almost certainly fire me. At 8 a.m., the Northern Rock opened at 210p and went down from there. By mid-afternoon, with the share price in the 160s, Dave called me up to apologise and congratulate me on taking this tough decision to sell. <laughs> My job was safe for another day. <laughs> The 
mistakes I made, of course, were not understanding the weakness in Northern Rock's growth model, that it was very reliant on easy conditions in money markets, and then not selling out at the first profit warning in June 2007, when the management team first alerted investors to this weakness. Some fund managers firmly believe that profit warnings are like cockroaches. There is rarely only one. And indeed, some of my colleagues did sell out at that time. Luckily, I did not compound the error by refusing to take the 245p bid after we had belatedly decided to sell. Northern Rock actually needed £28 billion pounds of Bank of England funding and was finally nationalised in February 2008. Shareholders lost everything, although today the business lives on as part of Virgin Money. When the facts change, as a fund manager you have to be flexible enough to recognise this and not become too wedded to a share that you may be selling at a loss. Sometimes this is hard, but it is of course the case that even when it had fallen 75%, Northern Rock still had 100% to fall. The financial crisis certainly changed the world and my career. The company I was working for bailed out a rival and as a result of a change of strategy that followed two years later, I moved from UK equities into multi-asset investing for the last decade of my career. Unlike in many other professions, fund managers make mistakes. Plenty of them. If an airline pilot or surgeon got 50% of their decisions wrong, as on average fund managers do, they wouldn't last very long in their chosen profession. As a fund manager, you can buy a share today for what you think are all the right reasons, but it can have a profit warning tomorrow, or be impacted by a geopolitical event that no one could have foreseen. Or perhaps your positive thesis can play out exactly as you expect, but months or even years after you predicted. You have to be resilient and adaptable and be prepared to be wrong. That is not to everyone's liking, but if it suits you, fund management can be a rewarding and endlessly fascinating career. Right, so that's obviously a very interesting story. Um, Bailey Gifford were also involved in Northern Rock. I can remember the discussions uh, extremely well, not sort of from the sidelines, thankfully. Japan having gone through its own banking crisis that is enough for any anyone's career. Um, but Alice, can you bring any insights into the Bailey Gifford debate that was going on at the same time? Yeah, so at this point I was 11 years old, um, <laughs> not involved in fund management. But um, I actually spoke to Gerard, who is retiring this year, um, on our UK equities desk. And uh, Tony, who worked with Gerard back in the day, said, uh, can you go and talk to Gerard about this? Um, a week before his retirement, and having never really spoken to him much before, I sat him down and asked him, can you tell me the story, please? Um, but yes, yeah, so at Bailey Gifford, we sold out a day before Tony did, <laughs> which apparently, um, you know, a couple of uh, maybe 20p in it or something, <laughs> more than that. A pound at least. Um, <laughs> Jared basically said on the Friday, um, Robert Peston had been on the news and had basically caused a bank run. Um, and on the Friday morning, they sent out people to go look at the queues on uh, Prince's Street to see how big the queues were getting and whether this bank run was actually significant or not. Um, and then there was an emergency meeting called. And Jared actually said this was the best mistake of his career because it was the canary in the coal mine for the rest of the banking crisis. So it made them look at companies differently and balance sheets differently. And despite the fact it wasn't the quality of the loan book or necessarily the gearing ratios, instead it was not having a scenario of what if the funding all just stops. And he said that was because they weren't looking broad enough at what could happen and potentially got too close to management. So when these profit warnings came out in the 
year leading to it, they had six or seven meetings, um, him and a few other colleagues constantly going down to Newcastle to ask them to explain their balance sheet, what was happening. And everybody in the market, including Northern Rock Management, thought it was down to some quirks in the wholesale market. Um, that some financing wasn't coming through. Um, HSBC had been involved with a, um, a problematic house company in America and they weren't sure if it would translate over to the UK. Um, but yeah, so, so Jared basically said that after this emergency meeting, they all went away for the weekend and agreed on Sunday night they just had to sell um, because they didn't think there'd be shareholder protection in it and even if there was, it might have to come through in a long time after um, and he said he was obviously telling all of this in hindsight, but um, the fact it was unprecedented and the fact the funding and securitization was quite novel as well was uh, difficult aspects of it. Um, so yeah, on the Monday morning they came in, decided to sell, found a broker who wanted to buy it in a block and left it at that. But um, they realized after there'd been some cultural issues when they'd visited management, the fact that the offices were named after the CEO and the CEO's face was plastered all over the wall um, <laughs> in sort of 10 foot pictures. Um, so yeah, a lot of Jared's sort of reflections on it were it kind of changed how we run our apparatus as well. So that emergency meeting on the Friday, um, there were over a thousand clients because UK Equities at the time was a big part of the BG business um, who were asking Jared for his opinion. And they, all the clients people were in the meeting and all the interested parties across the firm were interested in the meeting so Jared was sat there having everybody in front of him and the pressure of that decision making and potentially making a mistake not making a mistake or having the time to think was obviously a big deal so nowadays we actually have a bit more of a separation between our client side and our investor side so that we're not in times of stress or in bear markets we're not constantly um, being pressured into making decisions and it's more of a long-term consideration and obviously investors do meet clients but it's not in the same way of responding to day-to-day -day concerns which can make you either can be quite an issue for morale and I also think it's affected how we work as teams and again as Kleiser was saying about having stocks assigned to certain people or not and at the time it was assigned to one fund manager who all the client side was saying you've got to fire him um, which isn't, you know, the best <laughs> conducive environment to make mistakes, which, as we know, fund managers do and have to in their job. Um, and then the final things he said were just what it made BG do and the UK team do was try to make people not be fearful of mistakes and look for adequate risk. And there's, no, there's not a way that you can give clients a greater return unless you do take that risk. And you're not going to take that risk if you are fearful. So it's trying to think, balance all of those factors um, and always accept that there's somebody out there who knows more than you do and to be humble with what information you have and what decisions you make. Thanks very much and thanks for being brave enough to ask Gerard in his <laughs> last week at work. Um, so Ken, um, we heard that some of the issues in Northern Rock were that people really didn't understand the scenarios around the, the short-term funding, which is what sort of blew the business model out of the water. So how, how do fund managers analyze scenarios and what do you think about anchoring to the to the you know the book value or the something or you know how does that work for you? So so I guess if we look at scenarios and there's just so many ways you can do scenario analysis, you can try and pick apart balance sheets and rebuild them up and look if you get growth of X or Y, what does that do to the profitability of the business model? or how does the competition landscape change? We as multi-asset investors actually kind of take quite a holistic view. And what we'll sometimes do is we'll do scenario analysis, but very extreme scenarios. So ones that you would say is a one, two, 5% um, kind of probability event, but could have very material consequences for financial markets. And actually we had an example when we were doing it pre-COVID, we had a pandemic. And I think one of the things that that teaches you is that no matter how well you think or how well you plan a scenario out, it never happens anywhere near like how it actually evolves. So our pandemic scenario started in Brazil and I think ended in three months, two and a half years later, and we're still in it to some extent. So it just shows you that even with the best laid plans of how you're going to look at how a company or how an asset class behaves under dis different scenarios, it can still play out very differently. But what I think it's really important at doing is giving you a bit of a perception of the risks around an asset class. 
And that's not just downside, it's really easy to focus on that. So people usually look for the downside risk, but there's clear upside risks to a lot of what we do. And I think that's the important part, is that we should capture such a broad range of um, outcomes that, sorry, my microphone's very quiet, that it looks at the broad range of different possibilities for each individual investment. And I think that's why it's so important. I think, for me, actually, the part on HBOX, sorry, um, the, what's it called, Northern Rock, is uh, very interesting, because I think there's kind of two behavioral aspects to it. The first is saying, well, it's fallen 75%. You instantly anchor and say, I can't sell out 75% below. But that's not taking into account of the changing circumstances around it. As investors, we are, actually humans more generally, we're constantly exposed to behavioral biases. And I think what's most important is being able to identify those biases. And whilst you can't necessarily overcome them, understanding them is so important in being able to make decisions that would be considered rational. But I think actually there's also another side to it that some of the behavioral aspects of you go into a meeting and it just doesn't feel right. It's these behavioral aspects where you can't put it down in numbers, you can't put it, explain why, but it doesn't feel right. And that can actually be really important in the way you make investment decisions and factor that into review. So I think behavioral aspects are generally viewed as negative, but I think there are sometimes some quite positive aspects to them that you do need to consider when you're kind of evaluating either individual investments or asset classes more generally. Thanks very much. And Kleiser, do you want to comment on some of the similarities between the points that Tony and Anne made about advice on joining fund managers? Yeah, um, I think there's a recurring theme, if you haven't noticed, um, be adaptable, be resilient, be prepared to make mistakes. Um, with Anne, it was obviously acknowledged. It, and the first step is actually just acknowledging that you've maybe made a mistake. So with Anne, she recognized that there were issues in the new role that she had come into and she had to make some really difficult decisions. With Tony, it was acknowledging that this, you know, having a stop loss limit wasn't necessarily the best way to look at that. Um, but what was really, what they had done well was kind of act on those, act and make a decision um, after those mistakes. Um, and I think those are like, those, that is really kind of what defines being a manager kind of going forward. Um, I think that with this role, especially kind of my role, which is kind of long-term fundamental, um, instant gratification is not something you get with this job. So if that's what you're looking for, <laughs> this is not, <laughs> this is not um, the role for you. Um, it's really interesting when we all market our strategies and our funds, you know, we say past performance is not indicative of future um, performance. Um, and it's what I've really come to realize is that the success of being an analyst or a fund manager doesn't come until you're kind of looking at it in hindsight um, and seeing whether those decisions played out to your benefit or not. Um, so those are kind of the two main things I'd like to really like let you guys take away from what they've kindly um, offered up as advice and experiences. Yes, or gifting their mistakes yes. to the library, I think <laughs> is how, how, how it's been phrased. So I think now we can open up the discussion and go to Q&A from the audience. So um, we only have this one microphone, so um, I think you'll be asking the panel questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, stick your hand up and um, Tony will give you the microphone. Anybody brave enough to ask a question? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, it's not a very original question, uh, but it's for Sarah. Um, what was your biggest mistake and what did you learn from it? <laughs> good I, I don't know what the biggest mistake was. I think, uh, oh. Um, a few, yeah, probably, probably like Angus, um, learning to research fewer companies. Um, 
and yeah running your winners and not trying to do too much and the main thing is i learned is you have to have the mental flexibility to come into the office and believe that you could change your mind on your entire portfolio not that you should but there is the possibility that you could sell any of your stocks that you mustn't have fallen in love with them and that you couldn't you know believe that you couldn't sell any of them because they're so wonderful how could i sell this stock no you must believe that something could happen something could change in the world that would make you you know sell something even if you believed it was the most fantastic company the day before so i think it's that keeping that mental flexibility and you learn that through <laughs> experience <laughs> and, uh, the mar markets are a hard master i think that's what the these uh, mistakes that have been gifted to the library shows you know you can't, you can't fight reality um and people who try and um you know hold out for their extra 10p on northern rock or whatever it was or you know hope that liam fung was going to turn around you know, for years. I mean, Angus didn't say how long he held that, but, uh, you know, there were a lot of points at which that could have been sold before it got to the bottom. Mind you, Angus retired, I think, before it got to the bottom, <laughs> <laughs> which he didn't make. His graph was a bit unfair on himself. Thank you. I wonder if the panel's got any comments on what mistake making is like and how it's accepted now. And the reason I ask that is the, the mistakes we learned tonight, learned about tonight, were gifted. Were from people towards the end of their career or who ended their career in finance. They were talking about stuff they may have done as named managers, perhaps the only manager on the fund. And they had the weight of experience, other things they'd done well to get away with it, in inverted commas. Today, Funds are largely run by groups, and also everybody in this room, largely, most people in this room are at the beginning of their career. So how might approach, mistakes be approached instead? There's a reason why we haven't gifted our mistakes, you know? <laughs> we haven't had the long-term career track record to benefit from, but we did so well in X, Y, Z. Um, I think one, I, I'll just, sorry, I kind of jumped in to answer, but I'll, um, Kind of say just one thing i think this is where really culture comes into play um kind of, of where you work um for example there's definitely been times where i've fallen in love with a concept of a th a, like a, a theme or an industry and i was so convinced that you know almost you could buy any name in this industry and everything would be fine and 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 there was obviously a time where i was wrong um and there will be times where I'll be wrong in the future. Um, and I think it's really how your managers deal with that. So I know for a fact that if someone were to yell at me, which I mean, maybe in the past there were cultures like that in some offices, I, I would not have taken that well at all. Um, and I probably would have quit the industry. Um, but, you know, having someone kind of sit down and kind of act kind of go through the motions with you and also support you and just the fact just kind of the idea that yes we're all human beings and this career is really you know people make mistakes in this career and that reassurance and then kind of going back to the process um is what really helps me go through um certain times where i've made a mistake um, and i think that's where again yeah culture really comes into play and who you work with and you have to make sure that the managers that you work with um are teaching you in the way that is the most beneficial for you. Um, and granted, I know there are some students here who, and I obviously was a student like many, many years ago. Um, and I was like, oh, I'll take any job. <laughs> like, I'm just, I just really want one. Um, I think, yeah, like culture and making sure that you're in the right firm and making sure that you're with the people that you think can develop you in the best way possible is really, really important. Um, I wouldn't have stayed as long in my firm as I have if I didn't get that kind of support, um, just because I know that, again, yes, we make loads of mistakes, so you need to make sure that there's a channel there to support you when you do make those mistakes. But. 
I think, I think one thing that's really important, so first the team aspect, that you take risks in our job, that is your job is to take risks to generate return, and from time to time like making mistakes, that, that is what happens, you get you wrong, you misunderstand something, but having that team approach without the blame is critical. But I think the other part that's really important is you have clients that understand your philosophy. And I think if things go wrong because you're unlucky, so Tony's example, if Northern Rock was able to access capital, it could have survived, um, but it had a bank run and it didn't. Now that's luck either way, sometimes that happens. For end clients, having a clear understanding of the philosophy gives you a fair amount of room in terms of errors because as long as you're sticking to that philosophy and kind of doing what you say in the tin, um, provided it's not a mistake a week, um, and you have other things that go in your favour, um, over time, I think people are generally understanding of mistakes and understanding that mistakes are part of normal life, um, especially in what we do. You can't get everything right. If, as long as you get 51% right, you're doing okay. Yeah, and I think for me, um, I'm four years in and our training program is five years, so we're told to make mistakes as much as possible, not on purpose for the first five years, to kind of get comfortable, I guess, with the idea that you can't be right. And if you're hiring intelligent people from academic backgrounds that are always aiming for firsts, always aiming for achievements, sometimes that, that f initial feeling of, oh God, my decision cost 1.5 billion pounds or something can be terrifying. And you take it on yourself and that probably as I've seen it in my firm with more senior people just the the bond they have after having gone through these experiences and being able to lean on each other I think is really important and I think it's taking yourself out of the equation and trying to understand that it isn't blame that it isn't a problem that it's something that's part of the learning process and I think that's what kind of the entirety of tonight is about as well that um, we can't get everything right and surrounding yourself with the people that will support you and help you use it as a learning experience is the most important thing to do. Um, just going back to Anne's point on stewardship, um, does the panel have any opinion on the role that divestment plays in stewardship? I mean, from an outside observer, it may seem that divestment might be something that's difficult to justify to clients if your position isn't necessarily turning sour or isn't it immediately obvious to them why you would divest. But um, given that fund managers obviously have a role uh, to play just beyond their, their clients' balance sheets and also your own, um, do you think divestment is something that uh, should be um, the centre of more attention? I, I think it's context surrounding it that's important because I think alongside stewardship is engagement so not just engaging with managers but engaging with the board to make sure they're looking after all stakeholders be that shareholders and and the company and that's being managed in the right way now I don't think that means you have to hold a company through thick or thin if a company continues to do the wrong things or not act in the interest that you would um, believe is right then divestment is certainly an appropriate mechanism to reduce exposure to something um, that, that isn't going in the right direction. You can see if you divested in these companies well before, you've protected more of your client's capital and that's the critical thing. So I think divestment is something that's certainly important and certainly something you consider, but it's more of a last resort necessarily than a first, course, first step in the kind of process. And I think if you're talking about divestment specifically, sort of oil companies, um, I'll see if this works. Okay. Um, yeah, so if you're divesting from oil companies or ESG related. Okay. Um. Um, yeah, to, I mean, yeah, yeah, carry on, oh. sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I think it... Oh, no, is it me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll use the roving mic. Okay. Maybe something's magnetic on me or something that I didn't realise. Um, yeah, so 
depending what you're divesting from and the reason for it, I think there's a, a case to listen to clients and what their opinions are. And I think when you're managing university endowment funds or public pensions and things like that, I think um, the ESG case, particularly for how the world's changing, climate change, everything can re should really be considered. Um, and this is sort of my personal opinion on debates we've had internally, but um, I, I guess one of the biggest questions we ask is, is it part of the problem or is it part of the solution? And sometimes it can be what you think are the biggest, baddest companies in an industry that can actually fund the change. Um, and I'm not saying that's like, I'm, you know, bullish on Shell or something like that, but it's more to say um, taking a considered approach to this stuff, I think, leads to the best outcomes. And depending on the strategy and on the client's needs, I think that that also affects it. Um, yeah, uh, I think we've got, we're sort of divesting generally um, across sort of our sustainable funds away from certain companies. So I think it's just, again, understanding how the world's changing and making sure your analysis and your fundamentals line up with what's happening in the world. And I think, um, yeah, so I think it is important to understand what divesting could mean, um, both for strategies and for clients. Right, I think we've probably got time for one last question, if there's one more question. Oh, is it? All right. Sorry, I thought it was right at the back. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to ask, um, what would you say um, is the signal that you kind of developed that a problem is going to happen? So whether it's something you learn uh, the hard way or it's just something you use in general? I don't think there's a single point that something bad is going to happen. If you look at COVID, you could point to... Point to 10, 20, 30, 40 different events. Two weeks before COVID, I was walking around Vienna going, this is great, there's no other tourists. And it's funny how you can ignore information. So I, I think you can only ever identify the point at which you should have made the decision after everything's either gone wrong or well. So I, don't, I think it's really hard to say that's the specific point. Usually it's a combination of multiple different things. Yeah, I mean, usually when you go, when we talk about mistakes, it's in hindsight, right? You're like, ah, yeah, see, that was the, that was the mistake or that was the moment. Um, I think, you know, there's, there'll be times where y you look at a company and um, it won't necessarily have a profit warning, but maybe, for example, certain costs will go up, right? And you go, okay, is this company suddenly um, being less profitable because they're not they're mismanaging their strategy or is it because they're investing in something that they think will be really successful um, and you could point that as I mean depending on how it goes whether their investment is does really well or doesn't then that's like a signal for maybe being a problem but you won't know until the event actually happens so I think when we talk about being adaptable and being resilient and taking action um, or making a decision anyway. Um, it's really just, you can't foresee a problem happening because if that was the case, then I would obviously be retired and you know living on a yacht somewhere. Um, but um, it's all about kind of what you do after that that really defines how grave of a mistake that was or is. I think partially alluded to by Tony and when I spoke to Gerard was the fact that um, it was an unprecedented set of sort of signals that had come together and in hindsight it's quite easy to sort of build that picture up and um, as Angus I think said about sort of the history rhyming um, and not necessarily repeating itself it's kind of trying to learn from mistakes in the past seeing if there's particular things whether it's balance sheet related or um, company culture and trying to apply it in that context and trying to gather as much information as much maybe differentiated insight or opinion and building up that picture in a way that kind of informs whether it is something that's actually real um, and yeah and I think it's like, again back to that company culture and being able to discuss things openly in a team and transparently and trying to as Anne said act with integrity um, when you're feeling you know, have that feeling or you, you think there's something else that needs digging into um, that you have the ability to do so. And yeah, so I think it comes back to teamwork, really. Yeah, teamwork's always at the heart of it. So thanks very much for attending. I hope we've managed to give you some 
insights into mistakes, how to cope with them, if not avoid them, because they're probably unavoidable in an investment career. Um, and thank you very much for coming to the Library of Mistakes. I'll let Tony say the final words. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, panel, for a fascinating discussion. I think the key thing is always to try to learn from your mistakes. It was really interesting last night listening to Alistair Darling, who was talking about the financial crisis and what went on, which was actually, you know, Royal Bank blew up a year after Northern Rock, and uh, Alice mentioned that you know, Northern Rock was the canary in the coal mine, sadly. You know, it, it didn't, um, those lessons weren't learned at, at, at that time, and it nearly took down the whole. Apparently, according to Alistair Darling, he got a phone call from the chairman of Royal Bank who said, I'm terribly sorry, we're, we are three hours from running out of money, and what are you going to do about it? So, <laughs> so um, that was the, the challenge they faced at that time. So I've, I've put a slide up showing that um, if, you'd, um, if you enjoyed your visit and you'd like to return, you, you can come access during the day once we open next week. But you need to be signed up as a, a reader at librarymistakes.com forward slash visit, or you can support our work through the, um, through the Just Giving site uh, listed there. So finally, I'd like to thank you all um, for uh, attending the, uh, the uh, Festival of Mistakes, the inaugural night of it. I'd like you to uh, join me in showing your appreciation to Sarah and the, and the panel for this evening. <laughs> and the very final thing is, if you'd like to you know, carry on the conversation, there's still plenty of drink at the, uh, at the back of the room. Thank you very much.